Hi, everyone. I'm Marzia Gassimi, and I'm going to talk to you today about what my group does at University of Toronto. So we focus on learning healthy models for healthcare. And why do I say healthy models for healthcare? I'm saying that because, you know, when I started my PhD, it was in computer science at MIT, and I had to, you know, sort of figure out what I was interested in, and I thought, I'm going to work in health. And there's the simple, you know, ideological reason of, you know, improvements in health are going to improve human lives, and so that's a great thing. We want to do that. But what really interested me is when I would go to the hospital with friends that I had or other colleagues, I would see the same patient get very different treatment recommendations from different clinicians, even in the same institution. And when I questioned this, my collaborator said, you know, we really don't have that much evidence to go on. We really don't know what it means to be healthy. We see people when they're really sick. And so being healthy is never a state we observe people in. In fact, we define being healthy as an absence of interactions with the healthcare system. So you are healthy when there's no data on you. That should worry you because we're at a precision medicine conference at Stanford. So what do we do now, right? We treat patients, there's medicine. What we do is we run randomized controlled trials, right? This is the gold standard, right? We have two medications, we recruit a study population, and then we learn some sort of rule with statistics or machine learning, right? The question is, do those results generalize, and for whom do, they th do we think that they generalize? So it's pop quiz time because it's the afternoon and you're all really tired, so we need to wake you up. All right, so question number one. How many of the current treatments that are used in hospitals, do you think what percentage are based on randomized controlled trials? Gold standard, right? Right? You want this to be high? It's not. It's 10 to 20 percent. So that's not good. Let's take something that we do have randomized controlled trials for asthma. Lots of people have asthma, and randomized controlled trials will run to see what sort of treatments work best on people with asthma. Now, what percentage of people who have asthma now and are being treated with those recommendations do you think would have qualified to be in the RCTs that were used to design their treatment? You got, yeah, that was a good guess, 6%. 94% of asthmatics are in the exclusion criteria for the RCTs that were used to design their treatment. And this is not because of malintent, right? This is because when you're trying to study a mechanism you remove all the variation and change one variable. And that's how we do this. But we're obviously missing a ton of nuance here. And so can we use machine learning to take all of the data that's available, all the things we've talked about today, all the things you've heard about, and say this is all really medical data in some sense, right? It's health data. It's how we're interacting with our environment, with other people. It's how we are healthy. Can we use that to learn what it means to be healthy? Well, yes, maybe we could, right? I'm here to sell you on the fact that you can, but extracting knowledge from healthcare data is really hard. Medicine is not new and ne neither is machine learning. So the reason we haven't done this successfully so far is because there are differences in using data that is found as a byproduct of the healthcare system versus recruiting a specific population and studying one thing in that population. And so for reasons of heterogeneity, sparsity, and uncertainty, it is hard to do robust machine learning in healthcare data. And I think one thing that always concerns me, one thing that I, I like to highlight to uh, anybody who's not uh, you know, sort of a, a core machine learning person, is the machine learning people are all a little bit afraid of the hype cycle right now because there can be unrealistic expectations. So I have had clinicians come to me and say, I have the data, you have the machine learning. Together, we could, no, no, no. Anytime anybody says the machine learning with a capital T, you should run away. It's not, it's not good, it's scary. So what can happen in machine learning is that models can be very good, superhuman, at doing something that we have optimized them to do. But that means that they are often wrong in ways that humans are not. So the top row is a deep neural network telling you what it thinks the optimal king penguin, starfish, freight car, and remote control are. These are famous examples in computer vision, by the way, like highly cited papers. We all know about this, right? It's in our limitation sections. Um, and the bottom row is my favorite. That's adversarial pixels. So it's a one pixel attack 
on an image, so state-of-the-art neural networks think that that ship is a car, that horse is a frog, that deer is an airplane. And this is all funny and cute for us to say here because we all know that that ship is not a car. And so when we ask the model to explain itself, let's make this interpretable, right? It says, oh, I thought that this husky was a wolf because you put it in snow. You never showed me examples of dogs in snow, right? It's got to be a wolf because I've never seen this context, right? So there's the snow. That's my explanation. But this is OK because we are all natural born experts in vision, in speech, in natural language. We are not natural born experts in medicine. In fact, you have to go to school for a decade, right? to be able to interpret images like these. And so when you have an attack that turns these images into something, it's harder to detect. So I do machine learning for health, and I focus on three broad categories of things. I'm going to quickly cover some recent research uh, and some past research, and then uh, give you some sort of uh, motivating examples for the rest of these talks. So the first thing I look at are what models are healthy? What kind of models should we be building in machine learning? I use predominantly the MIMIC3 ICU data for a majority of my research. And I point this out because uh, in, a, in a prior session, people have been talking about all the data that they use, what's available, what can researchers get access to. This is the only vetted use data set that's available with EHR data, de-identified, for researchers like me to use in benchmark situations. And it's data sets like this that move the field forward. This is our image net. And you still have to go through access usage controls to get access to it. But it's available, and it's available on a timeline that makes sense for machine learning research. So if I take this data, the things that I could do are look at hospital decision making or care planning, observe data, and then ask, can I predict in real time a drug, mortality, some sort of condition by some gap time before the doctor acted? The way that you would translate this to a machine learning student is predict something important in healthcare. So that's objective number one. The first paper out of my PhD was looking at predicting mortality with clinical notes. Prior to this, people used labs and vital signs. They did feature engineering. But all of my colleagues at the hospital looked at their notes, which looked like this which is why machine learning people hadn't used it before, because these notes are terrible. The, everything fails. All of the state-of-the-art natural language processing just dies when you try to give it clinical notes. Um, it's not like a Yelp review. So once you take this data, we use some machine learning techniques called topic models to model half a million notes from these, at the time, 20,000 patients. And this is cool because it's a generative model, right? You don't say, learn a model that's going to predict mortality best. You say, learn a model that explains the variation in the words that I see and the notes that I observe. Once you make that model, you then look at whether the latent states you've learned are correlated with the thing you want to predict, just first pass gut check. They are. It turns out you have increased enriched mortality for things that look like respiratory failure. And you have decreased mortality for things that look like cardiovascular surgery, which both make sense. And then you put it into a supervised, regularized prediction algorithm where you try to predict mortality in real time 24 hours before it happens in the ICU. And so it turns out for us that using the state of the art at the time, right? So these are the gold standards, SAPs and SOFA, acuity models with gender, time of admission, things like that. That's the blue line, and that gets worse and worse over time. It makes sense. Those risk scores get stale. But using the notes, that's the red line, gets better and better over time. And when you combine them in green, you do best of all. That's great, but that was in 2014, and it is now five years later, and that AUC has not gotten higher. So the state of the art right now if you look at the publications in my field, use GRUD, which is the last row in that table. It's a gated recurrent unit neural network that uses variable specific time decays to deal with missingness. So maybe more complexity is not automatically better in medicine, right? Which is a hard lesson for machine learning people to uh, absorb. And so the next thing is maybe we need to predict something actionable in healthcare, right? Try number two. So the next thing we looked at is, OK, forget about just using notes. Take it all. Take the demographics, take the vitals, take the labs, take the notes, process them the same way. Turn it all into matrices. Concatenate those matrices. I now have a matrix per person, which means I have a tensor across a hospital. That's great for a machine learning person. 
Because with a tensor, you can do many different kinds of models. We can learn switching state autoregressive models. We can learn recurrent neural networks, long short-term memory, or convolutional neural networks. And when we tested this on trying to predict the need for interventions, like vasopressors, ventilators, non-invasive ventilation, and different kinds of fluid boluses, the neural networks improve performance. So using all of this data in a high capacity model gives you better prediction, which is fantastic. But you know, they always ask you, can you interpret that? Which you, you know, from my previous example, you should know how I feel about, about that. Um, yes, you can. You can always create post hoc justifications using high and low capacity models, right? So we, we have good methods for doing this, feature level occlusions or doing short, uh, short term trajectories with maximal activations. But the question that you should be asking is, is this really interpretable? Would a doctor really use this? I don't know, would you? I mean, most of the doctors that I worked with told me, no, I wouldn't really use that. So maybe the next thing is we should create something that's actionable in a healthcare setting, not just predict something. And so the last thing that I'm going to tell you about for research is we recently created human readable radiology reports from clinical images. And this is cool because you're now getting an unseen image and generating the readable radiology report that somebody would like to have because that's not something a doctor would like to spend their time on. You're actually working on a process that a doctor doesn't want to do themselves and freeing them up to do other things. And so we looked at all this. We had quantitative checks. We outperformed state of the art. We have uh, better readability and accuracy in 12 different categories. That's great. The last question that we asked a, a clinical collaborator about was quality check. And he said, you know, it's right on most of these things, but some things it gets wrong. I worry about what it could get wrong. And so now the last thing I want to talk about is we're all going to rah-rah machine learning and health and precision medicine. And my, uh, my advocacy with machine learning students when I teach them, right, the computer scientists who I teach is there are questions beyond the obvious here that you need to think really carefully about. So remember that first paper that I did in 2014? There are biases in data that reflect the biases of society. This is well established. We know that this is true. So I had a friend ask me, can you go back and check that that original paper that you did performs equally well across different categories of people? And I said, well, I put those data into my model. Of course they do. But I checked. And they don't. So really what we need to do is create actionable insights in human health. Because if you go back and take somebody who has a PhD in computer science, who does machine learning, and who wants to make a, a huge impact in this field, there is topic heterogeneity across groups in that original model. And importantly, there are unfair accuracies. We predict important clinical things worse for some groups using state-of-the-art models with the data that we have available. And because most of life happens outside of the clinic, these problems are not going to get smaller when we use passive data, self-reported data, search data, imaging data. They're going to get larger, right? And so it's important that people who are really entrenched in the technology and the data are aware of these issues so that when we're making tech, it works better for everybody in all settings. Thank you very much.